Uh, and I think they're going to do it. <laughs> so, but, you know, is there any uh, truth to the rumor that you might get back together and do something with Guar? Well, I know that Guar is planning a big event since they're just like my wrestling career, in quotation marks, got the brakes slammed on it really super hard. Uh, the, you know, they can't tour either. You know, oh, yeah, so that was their right main source of income. So they've got to do something. And they uh, they wanted to do like some kind of a big uh, simulcast pay-per-view kind of a thing. But it's also going to be an anniversary. It's going to be like the, I think, the 30th anniversary of Scum Dogs, the second album. Wow. Wow. Which is debatably their best album. But anyway... They're going to do this big show, and part of one of the big attractions of this is that they're going to, uh, Slimestra and Sexecutioner are both planning on returning. Wow, Slimestra. Wow, the OG lineup. It's, Back together. Be, uh, yeah. Breaking news. So right they want to do the OG thing. And they've been uh, talking to me about doing it. I haven't really decided if I'm going to do it or not. Because there's a lot of bad blood still. Is there bad blood between you? Yeah, I mean, I did. I definitely feel like I was backstabbed out of war. I didn't. I didn't. Definitely didn't leave because I wanted to. And it was a. I mean, it was. I. I did it for like fifteen years, and there were a lot of straws, you know, before the camel's back finally broke, dude. And it, and it was Guar was just taking a weird turn. And Brocky was going off the deep end, and I did. I just. Uh, it was turning into something that I didn't want to be a part of anymore. You know? And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm much, I don't, you know, I'm really proud of everything that I did because I did a lot of shit. I like, one of the main things I did was I cultivated Guar's fan club because my main in, interest in doing the whole project was I wanted to make videos and I wanted to make comic books and stuff like that. I wanted to do artsy stuff. And uh, I like doing the live shows a lot, too, you know. But uh, at the same time, I wanted to print comic books. And I wanted to put out these videos. And, and so I sort of cultivated Guar's fan club, too. Uh, and I put out this newsletter thing called Mind Control Monthly that would have, like, uh, uh, each issue would feature a different one of the Guar characters, and I would try to get the actual character to write a letter in character to the fans, you know, on one page. And mostly it was just newspaper clippings and stuff like that. But it was also a way for us to get tour dates and stuff like that and just get cultivate a fan list that I would be able to mail to on a regular basis. And this is before the Internet, before uh, P- PCs. You know, I remember seeing the first time somebody showed me a computer that could do digital graphics, and I was like, wow. You know, I was totally drooling, and it was like, oh, this is, I paid $8,000 for this, you know. And I was like, what? You know, and I, my first computer I bought, I paid like 5000 bucks. I had to get my dad to co-sign a loan, you know. Wow. And But that made it possible for us to do color comic books. You know, and back to the what I was talking about was uh, through the newsletter and fan club and stuff. Then I started to put out bootleg videos and stuff, and then I used that money to start printing comic books and junk like that. And so I actually got up to I printed like seven issues of a full in full color. You know, plus it was a lot about encouraging the different artists to write and draw and do comics and stuff and. So that all the different artists that were involved were represented. Because there were a lot of guys, you know. I'm, uh, don't let me, I don't want it to, you to think that I'm giving you the impression that I, oh, well, I did it all, you know. Because it wasn't that way. At the beginning of the, you know, when Squawk first started, I was doing maybe 90%. But at the time that I left, I was doing maybe 10%. Because there was so much going on. And eventually, uh, and it led to part of the way that I got sort of squeezed out of it was that the fan club and stuff got so big that I had to split it and put another person in charge of a lot of the money part of it. And that was where it sort of lost control because it was sort of, it was sort of like when you have two dogs and both of them have a full bowl of dog food, 
you know, but it, one of the dogs just can't stand the fact that the other dog has a full, you know, and has to eat that dog's bowl of food first, you know, <laughs> what I'm talking about. And this is so, where the, uh, <clears throat> the bad blood started. Yeah, so it kind of got like that, and next thing you know, I got squeezed out. Be- because I had I was saving money, you know, that made it a target, you know. But I, I'd always sort of kept it separate from the band money. And and the other thing, well, I don't know. I, I probably shouldn't even talk about this shit too much. But, but But there's a lot of bad blood. I mean, but I'm really proud of all the shit that I did in Guar. I had a lot of fun. I created a lot of really cool characters, and if you check it out at the House of Huntar website, it, it, uh, there's a lot of information on that about Guar, as well as my portfolio of shit I've done since I've split from them, which is a lot. There's, uh, I've been doing a lot of crazy stuff. So you reforming like with Guar, possibly, for the pay-per-view. That's big news. Very, very. I may, very I may. May, <laughs> maybe. No, I'm not confirmed. I'm not saying no. Lots I'm, of I gave them a definite maybe. It. I'm waiting for them to, to like hit me with a bribe enough that will some sort of bribe. But I'm and I'm not talking about money because I'm not like a a person that's really I'm I'm motivated by getting shit done and accomplishing stuff. You know that's what gets me off and and uh, making money is like that's I'm really bad because as soon as I make any money at all, I spend it on supplies to make more art and stuff instead of something smart. <laughs> What uh do are you sitting on any of those Guar action figures that never made it out to the public? No, but you know that one of the things that I really like doing with Guar that was super fun, and it sort of ties into wrestling as well, is I used to love to work conventions, you know, like sci-fi horror conventions, comic book conventions, like that. I, you know, because I'm like super geeky like that too, you know, and uh. So I used to love to go to conventions and see all, like I met Dr. fucking Smith, Dr. Smith from Lost in Space and got to talk to him and stuff, you know, and uh, stuff like that. So I love going to conventions. And so, and it's fun too. So as a fan, you know, when somebody comes up to me and totally geeks out on Techno Destructo, you know, I can totally understand where they're coming from. You know what I mean? And it's really fun. Plus, I always try to have a uh, dominatrix girl with me to lead me around on a chain at the convention, too. And, uh, it's not a bad which thing. often you can really piss Danielle off, but I always try to do that if I could. And, and so it's really fun to interact with the crowd live and stuff like that. And uh, one of the people or one of the companies that was always at these conventions was Todd McFarlane Toys, you know. And I used to always hit them with this heavy pitch to, man, you got to make Guar action figures. And this was like, I'm talking a long time ago, before there were ever, you know, now there's action figures of everything, you know. Back then, the, the idea of a band having action figures, you know, nobody did that. I mean, know? it would have it made total sense had, for him to do that. Yeah, even Kiss hadn't even done it yet. In fact, that was the thing that super pissed me off, is because I... I um cultivated that connection at the conventions and stuff for years and was like, man, we're, you got to make action figures of us, you know, but we never had the big enough numbers, you know? So then next thing you know, they came out with these kiss action figures, but wait, they actually didn't, they, they changed kiss. They gave them weird armor. And one of them, I forget which character, one of them had fucking beefcake shoulder pads. I, I totally remember that. Yes. Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> They're huge. They- yeah, and no, and the funny, the funny insider story of that is that at the time, Gene Simmons' uh, manager was Bill Manspeaker, who's the guy that did Green Jello, right? Believe it or not, yeah, I don't know if you've heard of Green Jello. Green Jello is another Guar esque kind of band. Yeah, you know that does a right lot around of around the corner you know, from the podcast. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, and the, they're most known for the uh, Three Little Pigs animated video. It gets a lot of airplay. And they did this great uh, uh, video while we were touring one year and sent it to us in, while we were touring in Europe. And the band got pissed at me because I used to play it so much. But it was called Serial Killer, right? And it had that 
song Toucan Son of Sam, where uh, they made this character that's like Toucan Sam, and then he go he kills all the different serial characters, like, and they're all like bad versions of them. Like they have the uh, the Lucky Charms guys, this drunk elf, uh, or uh, you know, with the Irish accent, you know, and uh, uh, then they kill Snap Crackle and Pop, or these little puppets in a cereal bowl, and they kill them, and they chop their heads off, and blood shoots out, just like war, you know, and and, and they have the tricks. Rabbit is tripping. You know, and so that he's seeing all these colorful shapes floating around, you know, as the tricks rabbit. That's re- that one is the funniest one. And then Toucan Sam comes out and decapitates him with his wings, <laughs> you know. But anyway, so Green Jello was a similar band to Guar, too. But uh, yeah, no Green Jello is just stuff. a singer. <laughs> but let's talk about wrestling. This is a wrestling yeah. show, right? Yeah, yeah. Let's it's let's a, talk about it's a rock and wrestling show. We're on topic no yeah, matter yeah, what. Let's get a little wrestling in before we let you go. So you, uh, we, we heard you were uh, you went and saw the Briscoes. You saw Ivan Koloff. By the way, seeing Ivan Koloff live is pretty awesome. I mean, the man dethroned Bruno Sammartino in the longest run for uh, the heavyweight title. So that's pretty awesome. When do you start? Uh, w- what's your next... Um, era of wrestling, you know, after you know you're watching it with your pops. So, uh, I was talking about how the Slave Pit, our studio, was with, uh, only about 10 blocks from the Coliseum. So, when wrestling would come to town, I would immediately uh, go and buy like six tickets, because that's about all I could afford. I would buy as many tickets as I could afford and uh on as close to the ringside as I could get. A lot of them were reserved, and you just can't get them no matter what. So, But third row, I could get. So uh, I would go, and I would buy like six tickets, and then my girlfriend made these awesome shirts that were like red T-shirts that she had sewn a hammer and sickle on them, right? And I had like six of them, so we would all wear these red shirts and support the Russians, you know? We even had a plastic chain that we would hold up a lot, you know, that was like, it was like about this 12 foot long, awesome plastic chain that I used to use in Guar. And, uh, we would hold that up, you know, how did the other and, fans uh, respond but, to you at the time? Because the, because the Koloffs were heels, they could not even acknowledge us at all. <laughs> you know, so when we came out at first, this was when Ivan Koloff was doing the three man tag team, Against the Rock and Roll Express, you know? Yeah, uh, him, uh, Nikita, and uh, Crusher Khrushchev. Right. Oh, man, they were so awesome. I loved them so much. We had so much fun going to see them. And since it was walking distance to the Coliseum, we would get totally shit-faced because we didn't have to worry about driving. And, oh, man, we had the best time. We would scream and yell. And, uh, but... The Russian wrestlers could never acknowledge us, you know, because they're heels. They're not supposed to have fans, you know. And and plus, imagine that this is in the Reagan, Ronald Reagan Cold War year. So when we used to stand up and do this, the six of us in the Coliseum, the whole crowd would get pissed, you know. They would scream and yell. The whole It would, like, really piss off the crowd. And But on the other hand, imagine if Ivan Koloff were to encourage us, and what if... A bunch of stupid ass rednecks, because of this, start some kind of dumbass uh, Russian or not Russian, but communist, you know, skinheads or some sh- bullshit like that. You know, all of a sudden starts to pop up because people are dumbasses and shit. You know, so I can understand why <laughs> they wouldn't encourage us. Well, I, I got a good one for you. My brother was at Nikita Koloff's wedding, so. I can have maybe a, a link you two up, and you, he can finally give the praise that you deserve as an early fan. Wow. But you know what? We, uh, there's a little, little bit more history to that, too. Because I actually met Ivan Kolar, and this is really funny, because I met him when I was about 30 years old, and I talked to him, and uh, I sh- actually had a wrestling comic book that I had done. And in Guar, too, we used to do wrestling shows a lot, uh, where we would put the ropes across the front of the ring and we would have one of the Guar characters be the referee, have a referee shirt on, you know, and then we would have matches like uh, 
you know, Sly Menstra against O.J. Simpson and uh, Frank Sinatra or something like that, you know. And then the I climax did, of the night bring that up. The Techno Destructo Express, you know, which is probably what's going to happen. If there is a re- war reunion, you know, we would do some kind of wrestling thing with the You're going to pull out the old school Express. wrestling gimmick, stage show. Yeah, yeah. Love it. So, You're the, like the so original that, rock how and I wrestling sort of got band. into wrestling too, because I would sort of been doing sort of mock wrestling with Guar a lot, you know. And then at the conventions and stuff, when I would do conventions, I would work with Sex Executioner, and he and I would go through the crowd, and I would be going, "Where's Guar? You know, I came here from the other side of the galaxy to kick their ass, and I can't find them. Where's their booth? You know." And I would scream and yell until I actually got somebody to point you know, to the whole crowd, which way the Guar booth was, you know? Cool, huh? So then, at the same time, Sex Executioner is screaming about me being there. Have you seen this giant loudmouth cyborg guy with one huge, you know, monkey wrench arm running around? Oh, I'm trying to find him so we can bring him to justice or whatever, blah, blah, blah. So we would go through the whole convention like that until pretty much we covered the convention. And then we would see each other randomly and we would have our find a spot and have our impromptu fight you know and gather until too much of a crowd gathered and we would start to you know start too much of a clog in the traffic flow you know and then uh i would scoot off you know disappear into the crowd or some shit like that we used to stunt fight uh chuck and i used to stunt fight like that a lot uh chuck Varga that used to that played the sex executioner and in our private life, too, we used to go to parties a lot and get into a fake fight and, and until we got kicked out. <laughs> we used to do that for fun, too. I've done that a few times myself. <laughs> and, <Yeah. Chuck> would, <laughs> and gotten thrown out of the bar. <laughs> With the sex execution? No, I wish. Yeah. Yeah. I, I yeah, and see, Chuck, Chuck is from Charlottesville, Virginia, which, is, which was where that super fucked up riot went on but that's also where uva is which is a popular virginia college and there's lots of college boys around there and oh man it was so fun to go to to go out with chuck and uh because he he uh he looks kind of like a uh a neanderthal kind of like he's really big and he doesn't he he doesn't look like he would be very intelligent, but when you talk to him, he's like super hyper intelligent, like uh, like crazy. Which is one of the things that I liked about him was he's like really smart and articulate and stuff like that. So he would get into these places with all these frat boys, and uh, all all of a sudden there would be a conflict, you know, and he would like just hit them with this intellectual barrage that would just piss them off so bad, you know, that, and then they would want to get physical with him and he would kick their ass, you know, and it was so much fun to watch, you know, because he would just give them the intellectual barrage and then it, that would make their, you know, temperature rise and it, until the mercury was squirting out of the top of their thermometer and then they would jump at him and he would just lay him down. It was awesome. It was awesome. So okay, now you're a big fan of the Russians. Um, what, 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 um, what? What do you? What? How do you? Uh, what's your when next I moved, step after I in split wrestling? From Guar, and I moved to Philadelphia. And the reason I moved to Philadelphia was that I'd worked with this company. Uh, I, one of the things that I developed with Guar also was the tabletop board game with the miniatures. You know, like Warhammer 40k or something like that, where you have tons of these little toy soldiers and you roll in dice to kill each other, you know? It's, it's, a, it's something that I'm also really obsessed with as a super intense geek from another galaxy. And uh, so, uh, and we used to play these games too in the Slave Pit, and a lot of the characters that, that are in Gwar, you know, I used to make Gwar characters and as, you know, alter my miniatures, cut them apart and glue them together and make Cardinal Sin and Techno Destructo and stuff. And we would actually play these geeky games and roll dice and kill each other and stuff. And I was, so I met a company at a convention that was a game company and I was like, hey, let's do a Gwar game, you know? 
So I worked with this company a lot, and uh, I started to do freelance artwork for them for their other games as well. And so uh, I helped them develop this Guar game, and it was really cool because all the characters and the way they behaved and everything was true to the Guar universe because I was involved and made sure that everything, they didn't just make up some weird, stupid bullshit. It was all, you know, Beefcake was like Beefcake and Flattis, and all the characters would have the powers and abilities that you would think they would have. You know, it was really fun. It was really fun. And we put a lot of weird shit in there like drug addiction and stuff like that that might give you a bonus, but it might also cripple you for the rest of the game, you know, which was really fun. What was the name of the game? It was called Rumble in Antarctica. And uh, we, there was a line of miniatures and stuff, and, but their main game was called Shock Force. The company's name was Demon Blade when I first started working there, but they had gotten a lot of flack from Bible Belt states about carrying their prop product with a name Demon Blade on it. So they whisked out and changed their name to XB9 Games, too. But I think part of that also might have been because they got into a lawsuit with, uh, with Games Workshop that makes Warhammer 40K, <laughs> which cost them a lot of money. They, they did some characters that were pretty much a blatant ripoff of some of their, of some of Games Workshop's figures. So, they got taken to court and sued over it. Yeah, it was it happened. But I moved to Phil after I sort of split with Guar, or before I split with Guar, actually, because I wanted to continue to work with them from afar. I moved to Philadelphia because this company offered me a job as the art director of the game company, and I was like, cool, you know, because they were like, well, we were really impressed with all the stuff you've done promoting Guar and stuff like that, and we'd like you to do that for our company too. Right, so I'm like, awesome. Let's go. What year? What year were you living in Philadelphia? I would say this is around 2000. This was around 2000. Okay, so right so after ECW, Philly, you just missed ECW by like a year or two, I guess. Being in Philly, I think ECW was going on because the guy I was working with, what was the guy's name? Oh man, I hate to even say it because with my horrible Southern speech impediment, there's no way it's going to come out right. But Jason, do you remember the name of the guy? Uh, his name was first name was Dave. It was something like Shahadi. You were working with Dave something? Dave Shahadi, High Society. Dave Shahadi. Wow, I said it right. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I I met him, and he was the first person that actually trained with me in a real legit wrestling ring. You know, and he actually did. We worked out some matches with Techno Destructo. And we did some pretty cool matches, I thought. But you know, it was my first stuff, so it, you know. I got to I I got to be involved in that with you. <laughs> you learned how to moonsault at that. He was doing like a Ted DiBiase super rich guy character. Yeah. So we had one funny gimmick where he tries to bribe Techno Destructo with his credit card, and Techno Destructo swipes it through his armor, <laughs> you know, and then rejects it, and uh, some stuff like that. So we did a couple of things like that. I think we did a little bit of blood. No, I don't think we did any blood. I don't think I did any blood with him. So, I worked with him a little bit, and then uh, I got an opportunity to move to L.A. because there were these guys, the Grasso Brothers, who were doing a magic show, and they had toured China because in China, it's funny because China's in the news now, but this is at the time uh, uh, see, well, China has all these huge mega factories, right? And these mega factories in China, it's hard to describe, but they still have slavery. And so whenever you buy something from China, you're supporting slavery. You should remember that. And that's the way that manufacturing is, you know, they stole manufacturing. Oh, we can make it cheaper here because they have fucking slavery there, you know? And they have, so they have all these workers that work in these mega factories, right? And in order to keep them from revolting, they have to entertain them every once in a while. So the Brasso brothers worked for these, this company that toured China and entertained these throngs of factory workers, you know. And they, so they would, get, they would have a variety show that had magic and music and different kinds of things in it, right? So the Grasso brothers were part of that, that tour or a tour doing that. So they, came, they wanted to work with me and come up with a super crazy 
gore-esque magic show with tons of puppets and giant monsters and weird shit in it. And we were going to tour China and we were going to develop this show, tour China with it, and then end up in Las Vegas and do it permanently there. You know, that was the, that was the idea. So I was like, yeah, let's move to, <laughs> I'll move to LA to do that, you know? And so I, I did tons of artwork, all created all these puppets through costumes and, and uh, big rubber monsters and stuff. And the, uh, I actually built this really cool thing where the magic trick was it was a lion that eats people and then spits them up later. And it's like he, he eats multiple people and you're like, where are these people going? There's this giant lion that walks around on two legs, kind of like a troll or something. And he has a, his whole body is a big face, you know? So I built this lion for them, or started building it anyway, and uh, came to L.A. to do it. And then they go to this meeting with the, where there's a backer. And they come, I was, like, all excited. Wow, this is, is going to be it. This is going to be my big break, you know? So they come back from the meeting, and they go, well, uh, the meeting went really good. The guy, the backer likes it and all, but he was so into all the puppets and the costumes and, and all the characters that you made that we were afraid that, it, that it's going to make the magic take a back seat. So we're going to have to let you go. And I was like, what? <laughs> but the good news is here I am in LA, you know, so I got a job working at a prosthetic shop, which has my, been my shitty day job for, for all through most of Guar. And, uh, but, so I'm, I work at a shop that makes artificial limbs and stuff, but a lot of the materials and things that I do there has also helped me translate that into the crazy props and costumes and things that I make, especially my claw. Like my, techn- my new design, the design that I use now, <clears throat> which was, I actually came up with while I was in Guar, uh, the design of thing I use now is largely based on things that I learned how to do making artificial limbs. So that's where a lot of gore comes. <laughs> so once I got into L.A., though, then I'm I'm looking at the weekly L.A. Uh, bar paper, you know, what to do in town, and I see this this ad, full page ad for this crazy lucha show called Lucha Vavoom that has burlesque dancers and lucha and i was like wow that sounds like a lot of fun i want to go see that so i order a ticket and online and i get this email back is this hunter jackson from richmond virginia and i was like what are you kidding me so i uh answered it and it turns out that the girl that's running this show used to be guar's manager and i knew her from from Back then, she had been our manager for quite a while, through from Scum Dogs through, uh, I'd say, the middle of uh, the 90s or so. So she was our manager for quite a while. And uh, so I was like, I went to the show and saw it, and basically it was like a lot of her old uh, over-the-hill stripper friends doing these really incredible burlesque shows, like things like, there was one that was really awesome where they turn off all the lights in the theater and then that girl, uh, or no, Catwoman comes out with a flashlight, right? And then Batman or Batgirl comes out with a flashlight, you know, and then they get in a fight and rip each other's clothes off. I mean, who can ask for anything more, you know? That's entertainment That's right That's a five-star there. match. Yeah. But she also would do crazy stuff like she had this guy, this male stripper that was really funny, where he comes out on a pogo stick and he's wearing a full suit of clothes, you know, a suit and tie and everything. And somehow he manages to get down to like a G-string with, uh, without missing a lick on his pogo stick. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a lot of funny stuff. But she also did, would do things like she liked a lot of, have, have a lot of, she's from San Francisco. And uh, her origin story is that she, um, she like, r- lived in San Francisco, and she uh, ran this gay cowboy bar called The Covered Wagon that allowed her to do punk rock shows on Thursdays. <laughs> so she, and every, every punk rock band ever known has played there, like the Dead Kennedys, 
and even back to uh like um oh man the red hot chili peppers <laughs> back when they were a punk band shitty punk rock band <laughs> <laughs> and stuff like that. So she gave Guar our first San Francisco shows and stuff like that at her at the covered wagon. And that's sort of where we hooked up with her and met her and she became our manager. Next thing you know, I meet her at Lucha Raboom and she gets some of the Lucha wrestlers to train with me. And I trained with this guy who was, his name was uh, Shamu, Shamu Jr., right? And he was this big, huge dude, huge kind of a uh, chubby type dude that had a killer whale fin on his head. And uh, he was awesome. And I, I learned a lot from them. And they had an intermediate class, and then they would do the advanced class. So I went through the intermediate class first, and nobody spoke any English the whole time. You know, I had to, like, pick it up. I don't know any Spanish hardly at all. I, uh, I took it in high school, but all I remember is the teacher going, can't say, can't say. <laughs> Which means shut up did, what, or be quiet. Did Samu, your trainer, did he happen to be one of the head shrinkers? No, 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 no. Although I did train with later on, once I met Simboni, he hooked me up with Rikishi, who has a super awesome school called Knox Pro, where a lot of those Samoan dudes, including some up-and-coming Samoan dudes, that at the point where I was training there, they were grooming them, but they weren't even close to going to WWE yet but they're destined to be there sooner or later. And yeah, the rock is part of that family and everything. Yeah. Just yeah. Huge wrestling family. One of the, you know, as you're well aware, so many great families in wrestling, the Von Erics, the hearts, the funks, the Briscoes you talked about earlier. Uh, uh, did uh, Cody speaking of the dusty son, Cody, did he do freak show wrestling with you guys? He sure did. I remember a show that he was in that where I was there. Yeah. I remember because he fucking sucked all the money out of the budget. <laughs> <laughs> well, American dream. <laughs> yeah. It was fun. That It was fun. Yeah, Freak Show was so awesome. One time we did, one Christmas, we did a Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer match, right? Where Tim Bode got all of his whole lineup of, uh, you know, everybody he'd get a hold of. And he dressed them up like different characters from Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, right? And But the funniest thing was the guy that played Rudolph is this dude who is like the most buff of anybody in the whole show. The, 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 main, the, the most, you know, jack bodybuilder guy in the whole show. He, they painted him like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. <laughs> and, I, and I was the special guest referee of the match and spent most of my time outside of the ring duking out with duking it out with Rudolph because that was supposed to be a lead up to us having a, a our own match one on one match later on but uh, something happened but anyway they had a lot of really cool characters because he has a female giant called Andrea the Giant and she was uh she was the abominable snowman and uh, they painted, she, she had this big furry costume and painted her face blue. And uh, yeah, Freak Show Wrestling was always really, really fun. Yeah, they and came that, up with know, some that, really um, crazy stuff. That match with John Morrison and stuff, that was extra funny because Santa Claus had like six elves, you know, at ringside or guys dressed up like elves. And Jesus had six apostles too. So there was all this crazy stuff where each guy's, entourage turns on him and uh like uh john morrison played jesus as like this jaded rock star jesus with sunglasses and stuff so he played and, himself uh <laughs> and mary uh his mom comes out and there was this like creepy son mom sex relationship going on where she put she had this like really super curvy stripper chick to play Jesus's mom. And she pulls her skirt up and she has like these panties on to have Jesus written across her butt Jesus. and stuff. And then, uh, the other, his, uh, girlfriend, Mary comes out. And so girlfriend, Mary and mother, Mary are having a huge fight, you know, and that's part of the story too. So, and Jake, the snake Roberts comes out at the end and lays his snake on somebody. <laughs> you know, <laughs> It's crazy. It was crazy. Yeah, well, you, you, you know, know we'll, we'll wrap so, it up in a minute or two. But I want to let's let's talk about a couple more characters from Freak Show Wrestling. There's a guy, uh, Jay. 
His name is Singh. He plays a Robert Smith character. What's up with him? Yeah, Singh is really funny. He has his face painted like Sting, and he comes out and 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 plays does uh, an acoustic set on an acoustic <laughs> guitar and sings some really funny parody songs of uh, you know pop tunes and stuff. But he's really really hilarious. And so one of the you know Sim Bodie does uh, came up with a lot of the cool matches, but. One of the things I loved working with him for is he actually let me do some ideas as well. Like uh, when I was working with Serial Man and we were doing the bloodbath for a balanced breakfast. And he also let me do this really cool Easter egg hunt of death, which was really fun where we had East, uh, did it with Daryl the Devil Drexel. And it was supposed to be science versus religion. And uh, it was the Easter egg hunt of death with, where we had a Easter basket on each turnbuckle that were full of eggs that had fake blood and stuff in them and i made some bunnies that had guts inside of them so we were ripping open the bunnies and smearing them in each other's faces and stuff it was really crazy it was really fun one of my and, uh, favorite matches like uh was the the one where the octopus tentacles starts attacking everyone in the ring oh man that was that was super crazy that's there one of my favorites under the ring and yeah. there were octopus tentacles that they had each octopus tentacle had a puppeteer on it. And uh, so they're writhing around and the, the wrestlers in the ring. Plus it was like about a hundred person, uh, you know, elimination match where people are constantly running in. In that match, I played Scrotum Moon and I got eliminated by Crime Time. Remember them? They, uh, they grabbed Scrotum Moon and threw him out of the ring backwards. It was fucking incredible. It was awesome. And uh, then I came back as Techno Destructor to more toward the end. Actually, that was where Serial Man and I first started our rivalry because he eliminated me like pretty much as soon as I got out there. And then we spent the rest of the match duking it out outside of the ring and all. But there were so many wrestlers in that ring. And I'll tell you, man, that was, that was our last ma- match we ever did at Rikishi's uh, Knox Pro because we did two things that Rikishi does not tolerate. One is we went into overtime, you know, our, our match, our whole show ran hours longer than it was supposed to, you know. I mean, that match, it went on for more than an hour. I don't know how long it went on, man. It was incredible. And there was, uh, but we also totally trashed the place because the octopus tentacles, all kinds of chips of paint and stuff came off of them and, Oh man, it was a huge mess. Rikishi was so pissed. He was so pissed. Freak Show never did a show there again. But for a while there, we were doing shows, one show in Vegas and one show in LA every month for a while. It was really fun. We just, I, I'll tell you, man, I, I learned a lot. I learned so much. I also worked with Brian Kendrick during that time period as well. The Brian we actually Kendrick. went to his school and, and survived. <laughs> Because, you know, when you do wrestling school for real, it always starts off with enough exercise to kill a normal person. Yeah. And much to my surprise, I, I made it through that. And I did it. I was, uh, you know, and I trained with them for a pretty long time until I could only train with them a limited amount of time. So once I started to fall behind, I was like, you know, I think it's time for me to back off now, you know, because I am like super old ass man, you know, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, it was fun, man, and, and uh, I, Brian Kendrick is the awesomest. I highly recommend his school. It's uh, what they call it? the uh, Santino Brothers. Santino Brothers. Uh, if you want to learn wrestling, man, come to L.A. and go to the Santino Brothers School. You can't do any better. All right, bud. Well, thank you very much for uh, joining the Rock and Wrestling Connection podcast. We had a great time with you, Jay. Yeah, so yeah, to me, Techno Destructo, you, you know, it's like the original Rock and Wrestling I mean, thing. Bar. He brought it all together. You brought the wrestling into the music. I mean, I, 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 would you consider yourself one of the pioneers of, of connecting wrestling with music? Maybe. I'll take that. Yeah. If you want to call right? me that, I'll take it. Can, can we uh, can we get techno destructo? I'll tell you this: what I am doing is I'm trying to bring the same thing to professional wrestling through techno destructo's adventures and stuff that I brought to rock and roll through Guar. That's I think that's a better way. You're doing a great job of it, brother. Thanks again. Thank bud. you for being into it and stand up for the sick 
fun that you crave because there's always somebody out there that's trying to take it away from you. Yeah. You want to uh, plug your website again before we go? Yeah. Uh, I just revamped it. It's super awesome. There's Guar content. It's got my portfolio and other kind of stuff, and I'm going to be putting more shit up, too. It's called House of Huntar.com. And I also have a House of Huntar uh, YouTube page that has like half a dozen really hilarious wrestling matches that I did, including the Invisible Chain uh, Cage match, the Invisible Cage match against Sin Bodhi, and there's uh, Serial Man. There's also a Halloween Serial Man match where Serial Man got bit by Gangrel and turned into Count Chocula and uses can't how can Techno Destructo possibly overcome his super chocolatey powers? Well, as a uh, quick callback, maybe you could help us with this. Uh, do you know where Shawsville, Virginia is? Yeah, we were just talking about that, yeah. Uh, that's where, that is where Jimmy Boogie Woogie Man Valiant is living nowadays. So next time you come back to the East Coast, me, you, Jay, and we're going to get Jimmy Boogie Woogie Man, and you're going to interview him for the Rock and Wrestling Podcast. Wow, that would be awesome. But you know what we didn't talk about that we got to talk about is... The time that Techno Destructo kicked Bad Luck 13's ass <laughs> it's true. in front of a huge crowd. Yeah. We forgot to talk about that. I would like a rematch, Daddy. Oh, yeah, with Bad Luck 13. Are they still kicking? We are still kicking. Yeah, well, that, was, that you, was a great time. Don't you want me to plug your podcast? And, man, if we could do a rematch against Bad Luck 13 again, man, wow, that would be so awesome. Wow, Jay, we learned a lot today. This is so much that we got to break this into two parts. A lot of info here. Uh, possible Guar reunion. His wrestling career was going off right before the COVID. I saw that Guar is going to be playing drive-ins. You think they're going to be spraying blood on, on your windshield? <laughs> I'm going to take my uh, white sheet and put it on my car. You, what if you have a white car and you get in the front, right? And we got a new Bad Luck song in the beginning of That's, the... Uh, uh, new for a new movie that we're working on, actually. It's uh, coming out soon, I think. Oh, what kind of movie? It's a drug uh, apocalypse movie. Uh, it's called Gleam. Oh, nice. Well, James Callahan from Camp Rattler is directing it. He's a madman. We'll look forward to that. And I love yeah. the song on the uh, flip side, it's, too. Uh, what, are you, what are the old stabbing you up? It's stabbing an oldie, you up. Yeah. Is that about uh, sex or is that about killing someone? It's it's actually a funny story. I was... Um, f- rewind to 1999. They're filming a prison movie in Philadelphia. It's called Animal Factory. <laughs> right? Right up my the alley. The casting agent comes in they're using all real prisoners they're filming it in holmesburg prison in philadelphia uh steve buscemi directed it they come into the shop and asked me if i wanted to be in the movie because get this ready 20 years ago holmesburg prison none of the prisoners had tattoos and they needed a (laughs) tattooed man to stand in the prison yard Fast forward, now I'm in the prison yard. They use all real prisoners to <laughs> to film this movie, right? They give me a bracelet. They're like, once you're in there, you're, the only reason we're going to let you out is if you show us that, that bracelet. They put, I put it around my ankles. So, so they stuck me in the, uh, in the prison all day while we're filming, and I just hung out. Turns out if, uh, you know, you know, the... I actually made a lot of friends there that day, and one of the guys <laughs> that uh, I was talking to there was, uh, he was getting out. They use like, you know, people that were going to get out soon, I guess, you know, it's not like they have, like, violent people. Why but, would you uh, run away if you're already getting out right, in a week or exactly. two? So <laughs> the, the casting director is just yelling at us like we're five years old, being a real dick all day. Prison logic. Yeah, because fights are breaking out. It was, <laughs> it was fun. You know, it was like, and uh, at one point he's yelling, and this guy I, I befriended there, you know, uh, <clears throat> he's like, this motherfucker, I'm getting out of here tomorrow. I'm going to find that guy in the parking lot, and I'm going to stab him up. <laughs> and hence the song, Stabbing You Up, uh, came into fruition. Well, there you go, a little behind the music with Bad Luck 13. And uh, tune in next week for part two of Techno I can't wait to hear what he has to say in part two. We'll get him. All right. 
Jay, we're on uh, some social medias. Uh, All right, the, let's hear it, brother. The Rock and Wrestling Connection is on Instagram. It's Rock and Wrestling Connection on Instagram. It, it's very informative. You 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 have many people's birthdays on there. <laughs> it's all about <laughs> it's all about birthdays on there. A lot um, of a lot of uh, celebrity shout outs. We just want to make sure everyone has a happy birthday. In case, yeah, <laughs> you know, right, sure. If it's Don Morocco's birthday, I want to make sure he knows. I, and that I the want rock, to know. You I know. want to make sure Don Morocco knows that the Rock and Wrestling Connection wants to wish him a happy I birthday. I want to know when Hogan's got another year <laughs> under his belt. Yeah. I mean, think of all the entertainment these guys have given me throughout all these years. Right. The least right. I can do is wish them a happy birthday. How about Twitter? Birthday. Are we on Twitter? We are on Twitter. Now, it's a little bit more confusing on Twitter. On Twitter, uh, we are Rock ND Wrestling. So, Rock ND Wrestling. But... Uh, the great commentator Kevin Gill from GCW, he found us on Twitter. So hope he's following us now. Okay. You people can find us too. Are we going to get him in the studio? We're going to work on getting him uh, okay. on the show. Very I'm uh, good. working on that. You know, once I see someone uh, on Twitter, you know, now, I bug him right away. Now I know we're not on Facebook because it's for a bunch of complainers. But are we on Facebook? We are on. Facebook. We're on Facebook. <laughs> yeah. Are uh, we complaining on there? Um, no, we have a very positive uh, Facebook page. It's probably super rare for Facebook. It's right. uh, Rock and Wrestling Connection on the Facebook. Rock and Wrestling Connection. And we're here in the Creep Studios. These guys are on social media. What's going on there? The Creep Recording Studio. Yeah. You can find it. Yeah. Creep Recording Studio on Instagram or Facebook. For all your recording needs. What about any uh, stock tips? Do you have any more <laughs> stock tips for us? Hot tips. Yeah. Sell Tesla. Yeah, sell Tesla. Sell Tesla? I think so. Buy Apple? Jay says buy Apple. I would say buy a lot of stocks. It's what, you know what? Do whatever the so, rich so people about are the doing. Digital currency now. We're going Find to- someone who's rich yes. and, and buy whatever they're buying. <laughs> it's true. It's true. That's, That's my true. advice. That's well, on that note, we'll see you next week for part two. I can't wait to hear. Techno Destructo. All right. <laughs>